Hello and welcome to the Department of Occupational Medicine in the Matter of Misericordia University Hospital. My name is Dominic Nathan and I'm a consultant in occupational medicine here in the hospital for the last 23 years. I myself went to UCD so it gives me great pleasure to talk today about how we can keep you safe whilst working here and doing your, your fourth year resident year and also later on when you come back to do your internship or SHO or registrar or consultancy here in the matter. A couple of things I'd like to tell you about today and the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, hand hygiene. It's very, very important and as you will see today, I am wearing a short sleeve shirt and I'm essentially bare from the elbows down. That's very important if you've got any dealings with patients. This is to prevent infection from you to them and from them to you. There are plenty of places at the entrances to the hospital and at the entrances to all wards where you'll see tubs and containers of alcohol gel. It's just a simple question of putting a small amount onto your hands, rubbing it around, remembering to do it in between your fingers as well, and making sure that it dries off before you contact any patient. When you're working in the hospital, you will come across different types of sharp objects. Since 2014, there have been uh, European laws which have said that all hospitals must have protective devices in place to prevent sharp objects causing occupational blood exposures to staff who use them. In this regard, in this hospital, we have got things such as scalpels with blades covered until you use them first and then they can be covered over again once you're finished with them. Likewise, when taking blood, the needle is actually already covered in a container, a plastic sheath, and when you take it off, once you've taken the blood, which is taken through this container at the end, you remove the needle, and when you remove the needle, you press the bottom of the needle, and it automatically gets covered, so that there is no sharp object to be um, left around for others to come in contact. Likewise, when using a, an intravenous cannula, we've got safety sheets on them so that the user does not get uh, exposed to blood. And finally, for things such as taking blood cultures, we have a special type of uh, structure which is used only for these and as you can see fits directly over the bottle so that there's no direct contact between you uh, who may have uh, bacteria on your hands or arms uh, from the patient from where the blood was taken. So as you can see we have lots of protective devices and it's important that you use them at all times. Some of the commoner blood uh, protective devices are the ones that you see on programs such as EOR, uh, cardiac arrest and other uh, general medical programs. And it's very important that you wear them. These would include gloves. If you're wearing uh, protective gloves and you are suturing, the actual blood that is on the outside of the needle can be reduced by up to 66% if you actually are wearing a pair of gloves. If you're wearing two pairs of gloves, say for instance you know the patient is positive for an infectious disease, then the first pair of gloves will reduce the amount of blood going on that needle by up to 66% and the remaining lot will be reduced by a further 66% if you're wearing a second pair of gloves. So it's always worth asking yourself, should I be wearing one or two pairs of gloves with this patient? The next thing you should wear is a, a goggles or a face shield. These are available on all of the wards, although sometimes you may have to ask them because they may be in a clinic room and not easily found. But they are available and we would encourage you to use them because it is a frequent occurrence that we see people, especially medical students who are starting out, who frequently get blood splashes because they have not taken off the tourniquet, for instance, when uh, they are removing the needle from a patient and then the blood will be under pressure and would squirt out into their eyes. When you're attending a patient and you want to take blood or you want to uh, put in an IV, it's very important that you bring the right equipment with you. Believe it or not, the equipment you'll be bringing with you can be deemed as a lethal weapon. And indeed, there have been people prosecuted in Ireland for having such lethal weapons in their hands. Generally, they're muggers who are uh, mugging police stations or uh, petrol stations 
um, with uh, a needle full of uh, blood or a syringe full of blood in their hands. But nevertheless, the law has now stated that this is now defined as a legal wep as a lethal weapon, and you will be using a lethal weapon to take blood or put in an IV uh, kind of into somebody. So it behoves you to look after it very, very carefully. And when I say very, very carefully, it's not just about you making sure that you don't stab yourself or then the patient inappropriately with this lethal weapon, but that you don't leave it hanging around inappropriately and that you have the proper sources to dispose of it appropriately. If you don't dispose of it appropriately, it could be that this law may be used against you because you had a lethal weapon and you chose not to dispose of it properly. So the way to dispose of it properly and appropriately is to use a sin bin, and this is an example of the sin bins. They come in different shapes and sizes, and this is a more portable one that you will often see with uh, an IV tray, where you'll have a cotton wool, a plaster, a bandage tape, etc. This is a bigger one, which is used in more in the clinics, and in some of the other clinics you'll see an even bigger one. These are only supposed to be filled two-thirds the way up to the top. And the reason why they're only supposed to be filled two-thirds the way up to the top, and as you can see that there is a little line on it uh, just there, is so that when you put needles into it, that they don't flip over and the needle might stick out towards the top. Because, believe it or not, sometimes people put things into these bins almost by rote. They don't necessarily look at what they're doing. They see a hole and they put the, the needle into it. But if there's something sticking up, they may not necessarily see the needle and they may put their hand on it. So the idea is that you should only fill it two thirds the way up and then it's supposed to be sealed. And when you seal it uh, by closing over the lid, it's not meant to be able to open it again. So it's very important that you bring these with you and you dispose of all needles appropriately. Again, I would remind you that if you do not um, dispose the needles appropriately and you are found to be at fault, there may be disciplinary issues arising out of it. So let's make sure that we are all safe and uh, sound by using the appropriate equipment. A famous UCD professor of mine in the past used to say that every woman was to be deemed pregnant until deemed otherwise. Likewise, I believe that every patient is to be deemed infectious until proven otherwise. Therefore, it makes good medical sense that you protect yourself from infections that patients may have until it is proven that they don't have them. Frequently, we have patients who come in who may have coughs for many, many months and the cause of which is unknown. It makes good sense to wear a mask over your nose and face so that you don't breathe your bacteria onto the patient and moreover, the patient does not have uh, bacteria which you are inhaling. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about are occupational blood exposures. These are exposures, obviously, to blood, which can happen in many ways. The commonest way is through a needle stick injury, but there are other ways. So, for instance, you might get a laceration through using a scalpel. You may uh, get a splash into your mouth uh, when taking out an IV drip, or indeed, you may get a splash into your eye. The risks associated with getting an infection from each of these is different, and I'm going to explain a little bit about these infections to you now. The main ones that we worry about are the ones that are going to cause you serious disease, and by serious disease I mean ones which may actually cause you to die if you were unfortunate enough to get them. The risk is low, but nevertheless we don't want you to have any risk if at all possible. The diseases I'm thinking about here would be hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. I would hope at this stage, before you come to the hospital, that you already are being vaccinated against hepatitis B and that you know your hepatitis B status. This means that you know how much antibodies you have in your uh, system, and if you have no antibodies, you have a follow-up test to prove that you don't actually have the disease itself, i.e. that you're not infectious. Sometimes, particularly for people who are from overseas or from people who are from Eastern Europe, there's a great risk of actually being born with some of these diseases. And therefore, sometimes the tests are not as accurate um, as they were, would be if they were taken here in Ireland. 
This is why we repeat the test uh, here in Ireland and we do not just hepatitis B antibody tests but we also do a surface antigen test to make sure that the person working with other patients are not indeed themselves infectious. Likewise, we like to see that the uh, people working with patients do not have hepatitis C by doing an antibody test. And finally, uh, we don't currently do a HIV test, but we do ask people who feel that they may have risk of, of, of having HIV to come and talk to us so that we can ensure that they're being treated properly and that they are not posing a risk to themselves or to other people. If you get a needle stick injury or an occupational blood exposure, there are certain rules and regulations that have to be followed. At this stage, it's fairly universal what these are. But if you're in any doubt, there are actually guidelines which you can get by downloading them from www.emitoolkit.ie. And this outlines in a long form what the different rules and regulations are regarding uh, occupational blood exposures. But if you want the short version, you will find in most of the hospitals in Ireland a one pager just like this which will tell you what to do. And it's divided essentially into three parts. The first bit is step one, immediate first aid. If you've had a deep inoculation, you should encourage bleeding of the water under running water and you should cleanse it with uh, an antibacterial such as povidone iodine or betadine. Don't use a nail brush as this would only perhaps uh, force a virus further into your skin and just simply cover the wound with a band-aid. If you've had a skin exposure um, and you've uh, a clean skin with no uh, cuts or abrasions, then there is little or no risk associated with it. If you've got some cuts on your hands, such as you've pulled a hangnail off, then if it's fresh, there is a small risk associated with that. If you've had an eye splash and you're wearing contact lenses, you should take those contact lenses out immediately. I understand that some people find that they are blind without their contact lenses, but if that's the case, so be it. Take the contact lenses out and ask somebody to bring you to occupational medicine to have yourself checked out afterwards. The second part is reporting it. And generally, in most hospitals, we would report it to, we would ask you to report it during the day to the occupational health department or Department of Occupational Medicine. You should also inform your supervisor. If you were doing surgery, and you couldn't leave immediately because you were the only person assisting, then we would say to ask your supervisor whom you're assisting to say that you have to leave within a half an hour because you have an urgent needle stick injury to be get taken care of, full stop. There is a good reason why we ask you to attend the Department of Occupational within the first hour. This is for two reasons. One is the HIV virus particularly replicates very, very quickly. So the sooner we get to uh, um, respond to it, the sooner we have a chance of actually getting a proper outcome, i.e. that the person does not seroconvert to being HIV positive. Secondly, we know from animal models that if we give the post-exposure prophylactic treatment early, the earlier we give it, the more effective it's going to be. So if you get it within the first hour, we know it's going to be very, very effective. If we give it four hours later, it may not be as effective. If we give it 24 hours later, it's certainly not going to be very, very effective. If, and as sometimes people forget, or they think they, it's not as important until 48 hours later, they get the post-exposure pro prophylaxis, we might give it to them, but there's absolutely no guarantees because there's no scientific proof that it's going to work. So I will report, repeat again, really, really important that you go and get the uh, assessment carried out within the first hour and that you report it to your supervisor, but attend to the Department of Occupational Medicine immediately. We don't work 24 hours a day, but we have departments in the hospital that do. And the emergency department is where you should attend if our Department of Occupational Medicine is not open at the time. When you report it to us, we will ask uh, the surgical or medical registrar on call to get a sample taken from the source patient, i.e. the patient from where the uh, blood splash or um, blood exposure came from. 
and then we will send that blood or uh, specimen off to uh, the virus reference laboratory, which is not in this hospital, to try and get uh, an assessment as to whether the person is positive for hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV. Sometimes with some of the patients it's just a simple question of looking up their chart because they will have a blood test done recently. So for instance if you're working on the infectious disease ward where a majority of our patients with hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV would be then obviously your risk of exposure is greater but also your risk of knowing about the status of the patient is also better because you'll be able to look up at the charts before you actually have any uh, contact with the patient and say I must take extra care with this patient because this patient is known to be hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV positive. Sometimes it's not known and sometimes you have to be extra careful. So there are parts of the world where there's a lot more HIV, a lot more hepatitis B and a lot more hepatitis C than there is in Ireland. Because we're a small island on the coast of the Atlantic and on the uh, far uh, side of Europe, we don't have the same amount of people living in Ireland who have hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV who are indigenous. But over the last few years we've had a lot of emigration and some of these people are immigrating from areas where it is endemic. So sometimes, although you cannot judge a book by its cover, you have to be wary about uh, what a person might have and it comes back to what I was saying earlier on, you can't judge a book by its cover but you must be uh, conscious of the fact that any patient may have an infectious, an infectious disease until proven otherwise. When you attend the Department of Occupational Medicine or the Emergency Department, we will do baseline bloods on you. This is to make sure that uh, you have not got any of these, these diseases before you actually commence treatment. And secondly, it's useful for us to know that if you do subsequently seroconvert, and uh, God willing this will not happen, but if you did, that we will be able to match this with uh, the subsequent samples from the source patient when it was taken and prove that you were negative for it at the time of the exposure. The third thing then is counselling and follow-up. Obviously if you're at risk of getting hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV, you're at risk of having um, a little hiccup um, to your career if you want to go on and do other uh, um, parts of medicine where exposure prone procedures are carried out. The good news is, is that nowadays we have actually got treatments that are effective for hepatitis B, hepatitis C and indeed for HIV in most cases. And indeed, depending on what type of medicine you can do, you, uh, you want to do, we can allow people to do uh, uh, work as doctors uh, once we know that hepatitis B, hepatitis C or HIV positive, providing we have proven that they are no longer infectious to other people. And this nowadays, due to new treatments, is very successful. That's all I want to say about uh, exposure, uh, blood exposures, and uh, hygiene and uh, first aid. If you have any queries at any stage, we are on the eighth floor of the hospital in the McGivney wing, and you're very welcome to come and talk to us. Uh, I'm here, and there, we have two nurses here present, and there's also uh, a line, a phone number you can contact us, and that's 01 803 2813. And just remains me to say uh, best of luck in your time here in the matter and I hope that you enjoy it and that you get to uh, have a healthy and sa a safe time here. Thank you very much.